The independent senator Jackie Lambie has criticised the coalition over the decision to give Veteran Affairs Minister Darren Chester a key role in the Royal Commission into Veteran Suicide. On this program yesterday, she demanded the government consulted experts rather than government departments who she claims will not represent them. What stupidity to put Darren Chester in charge of it, the own Minister of the Department of Veterans Affairs, in charge of running around with those terms of reference inside his little group there. We've seen it all. That's why we're going to a Royal Commission, because the same people he has sitting at those service, those round tables, those service organisations, they haven't had anything to do with us for years. Well, the Minister for Veterans Affairs, Darren Chester, is live with us now. He's joining us from the RAF base in East Sale in Victoria. Minister, thank you for your time. You heard the Senator's concerns there. She took clear aim at you about the decision to give you a key role here. Is that appropriate, considering that your department will be in the spotlight throughout the Royal Commission? Well, good afternoon, Ash. And as I've said since the moment the Royal Commission was announced, the challenge now is to unite our veterans community. And that's my role, to, to work with our veterans from the ex-service organisations, to, through to experts in the field, through to families, defence personnel, individuals themselves. So my job is to unite the veterans community to make sure we shape the terms of reference to get the best possible outcome from this Royal Commission. Now, Jackie and I have very different approaches. She is a more divisive figure, and if she wants to hurl abuse at me, that's fine for her. That's not the way I do my job. I'm very happy to listen to Jackie's concerns when it comes to the terms of reference. I'm very happy to follow up issues on behalf of Jackie, as I've done many times over the past three years. When Jackie's office has contacted me, we've been able to follow up and help veterans together. So I'm surprised with her, her approach. But this is completely normal practice. When we've had the Royal Commission for Disability and Aged Care, the minister responsible does the initial work in terms of shaping the terms of reference, but then it goes to Attorney General and it becomes an independent process from there. So. Obviously, my office, uh, my department has the contacts and networks within the veteran community, so we're out there now already having these consultations and helping to shape the terms of reference to make sure the Royal Commission can do some good work. Yeah, and you are promising consultation and reaching out to the veteran community to do that, but Jackie Lambie also said in that interview with me yesterday that she says veterans don't want to be involved in government roundtables and veteran consultations because they say that they've found that if they criticise government decisions or the Department of Veteran Affairs, then they're not invited back and they're not listened to. Has your department, have you as Minister, been genuine in those efforts of consultation with the veteran community? Well, and if so, well, why did it take so long to get to that point of actually announcing the Royal Commission, which seems like it's what veterans wanted and it made very clear for a long time? Well, Ash, on, on the first point, I don't think there'd be any member of Parliament or Minister who's had more conversations and listened to more veterans over the past three years than myself as the Minister. And there have been plenty of robust conversations there and our veterans have let me know what they like about Department of Veterans Affairs and what they don't like. And a lot of those suggestions I've taken on board and been able to implement some very significant changes. And so one of the challenges about this Royal Commission is making sure that we build on the good work that's already been done. So DVA and the ex-service organisations, individual veterans, uh, families themselves, the work they're doing every day, either on a professional basis or a volunteer basis, is actually saving lives every day at the moment. So we need to keep that good work going. But in terms of the broader questions around whether we have a Royal Commission or not, the point the government made about 15 months ago when we announced our national commissioner was we wanted to have a commissioner that would be in place for perpetuity. So a national commissioner would do the retrospective work, look at the issue of suicide and attempted suicides, but then be in place over a longer period of time to continue to implement any changes that were required. Now, it became apparent throughout the course of last year that uh, the veteran community and the parliament itself wasn't going to pass that legislation uh, by itself and they wanted a Royal Commission first. So now we have a situation where there'll be a Royal Commission, which uh, the Prime Minister announced on Monday, and the National Commissioner doing that prospective work, that ongoing work as well. So look, I think it's, it's a good result. And the challenge now, as I said at the outset, is to try and unite our veterans community, unite our defence personnel and their families to make sure we're working together, because we all have the same aim. We all want to save lives. We all want to see better mental health outcomes for our veterans. And there's a lot of work we can do together. Can you reassure the veterans community that the commissioners who will be appointed to the Royal Commission will be entirely independent of the military? Well, what I can reassure them absolutely, Ash, is that I'll have no say in that. The decisions that are made uh, through uh, the normal processes, through the Prime Minister and Cabinet, Attorney General, uh, and I would expect, given the feedback we received already, they'll be eminent Australians uh, who have a 
capacity to run what will be quite a long Royal Commission, we expect. The Prime Minister himself indicated on Monday he expects it will take at least 18 months and possibly up to two years. So uh, there'll be eminent Australians who are well qualified to do this work and they'll be, they won't be appointed by me as the Minister for Veterans Affairs. They'll be appointed by others to make sure they're independent, obviously, of my department. And that's the process that norm is normally undertaken. But again, I want to reassure people that this process of consultation to frame the terms of reference has already started. The Department of Veterans Affairs website is available and people can go online there and get uh, directions to how they can have their say on the broader terms of reference and the, and the main things we've already put out there. So it's important that people who have a strong opinion actually express that opinion and we shape these terms of reference to make sure we achieve the most we possibly can out of the Royal Commission. Just another matter around the country, Australians are gearing up for Anzac Day commemorations over the weekend. Various state governments, though, Minister, seem to be being accused of bungling plans for those services. In WA, for example, the McGowan government's being accused of imposing too much red tape on RSL clubs. There's capped attendances, demands to erect fencing, carry out contact tracing that's led to the RSL clubs having to cancel some events. Are you concerned that in some states we're seeing one rule for sporting facilities, for example, and another for our diggers? Look, I, I think the point you make is entirely valid, Ash, and, and we need to, I guess, be a little bit kind in our consideration of the issues because these are very difficult times and the, the, health, the public health authorities in the states are absolutely determined to make sure we don't have an outbreak of COVID in any jurisdiction. Now, you know, last year, obviously, we didn't have any commemorative events at all and we all... Uh, commemorated at home and the dawn side vigils, the dawn, sorry, the, the drive side vigils at dawn, I think were a very good reflection on the way Australians still want to pay their respects. I want to see as many people as possible have the chance to gather at dawn services and attend marches and, and pay their respects. But I understand why the states are trying to make sure that they get that balance right between uh, having crowds in a controlled environment uh, and making sure they've got uh, the opportunity for people to respectfully and in a dignified way pay their respects to all those who served, those who've given their lives, but also those who've served so incredibly well over the past 18 months with things like uh, Operation Bushfire Assist and the flood recovery and COVID-19 and now the cyclones uh, in Western Australia. So it is a difficult balance for the state governments and they've all got to uh, uh, weigh up their individual health warnings. Uh, we need to do as much as we can to help those local RSL sub-branches conduct their ceremonies in a respectful way with as little red tape as possible. Your state counterpart in WA, the Veterans Issues Minister in that state, has come into fire. He said that he'd rather spend money on living veterans than on Anzac Day. Does he have a point or are those comments just completely outrageous in, in the lead up well, to Anzac Day? Well, well I, I, well, I, I think I think he's missing the point. Anzac Day is about respect. It's respect for the fallen, uh, respect for their families who allowed them to serve our nation, and also respect for those who continue to serve today. Now, commemoration and recognition and that quiet remembrance does help our veterans today. It helps our living veterans. They know they're respected. They know their work has been well regarded. It's a way that a nation can say thank you for your service. So these commemorative events are important. That's why we do them. Uh, veterans take heart from that. I've been to the Australian War Memorial, for example, Ash, in recent times and seen the last post ceremony where veterans are obviously moved by the experience. I've been to the Afghanistan exhibition at the War Memorial and seen uh, men in their 40s and 50s wiping tears from their eyes as they look at the videos and, and they understand that their service is being recognised, uh, that the work they did uh, in a foreign country is recognised here at home. So we do have to be able to do both. We have to be able to commemorate and respect the fallen, but also make sure we're providing practical support uh, for those who are with us today. Veterans Affairs Minister Darren Chester, I appreciate your time. Thanks, Ash. All the best. And if you or someone you know in the defence community does need support, please do reach out to one of the organisations on your screen, including Open Arms, the Defence Family Helpline or Lifeline.